For the fifth session of the conference, I would like to invite Associate Professor Dr. Nejdar Çıkıgil and the Chairperson, Professor Dr. Ayfer Altay. Thank you. Bir koşuşturmadır gidiyor girenler çıkar. <laughs> Can we start, please? Could our dear students settle down, please, so that we can start? Okay. In this fifth session, I would like to present you Associate Professor Dr. Nejla Çıkagil. Uh, distinguished professors, my dear colleagues and uh, the dear students, Nejla Çıkagil is one of the first graduates of Hacettepe University, University, Department of English, Language and Literature. During her undergraduate years, she took part in the amateur departmental play productions in English. In addition to these activities, she continued her ballet education to graduate from Fenman Ballet School with a diploma recognized by the Royal Academy of Dancing in England and the Ministry of Education in Turkey. She also worked with the Ankara State Opera and Ballet Company, appearing, among others, in Swan Lake as the Queen Mother. 
Chukugil continued her interest in dance when she joined the historical dance group of the University of Birmingham, where she was studying for an MA degree in Shakespeare studies at the Shakespeare Institute. She also attended summer schools at the University of London, receiving another diploma. She received her PhD from the theater department of Ankara University, where she conducted a detailed research on the semiological analysis of Shakespeare's plays as ballets, focus, focusing on Romeo and Juliet. After becoming an associate professor of theater, she started teaching history. Uh, she started teaching history of theater offered by the music and fine arts departments at Middle East Technical University. She also taught Shakespeare and world drama courses at Atalum University. Chikugil is a member of the International Shakespeare Association and the International Federation of Theater Research, and her publications are mainly on Shakespeare, ballet and dance, plays in performance, and ELT. She is currently teaching as a part-time instructor at Middle East Technical University while pursuing her research on Shakespeare and Shakespeare's works on stage, literary works as ballets, ballet and dance events in Turkey and abroad. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you very much for all the organizers for arranging this conference and allowing me to be here, back to my oh, first university, and being the very first graduate of the English Language and uh, Literature Department, of course, I'm very happy to be back with the department again, and members of the department, and young students who may not have been around when I was first student in this <laughs> department. Well, um, we uh, talked about various aspects of Shakespeare. We heard various aspects of Shakespeare. But all of them, of course, you've noticed since the morning time that they were all based on his texts and his plays and, of course, his words. But I will be moving from the words to Shakespeare without words. But before I begin, I would like to ask a question. Today, which is 29th of April, is a very special day. Would anyone know why it's a special day? It's a very quick question. Anybody know? Well, just to remind everyone, today is the World Dance Day. as the World Dance Day in honor of a famous choreographer from the 18th century, Jean-Georges Novak, and who was hailed by another 18th century very famous actor and theoretician, David Garrick, as the Shakespeare of Dance, which I will go back to during my uh, speech. And this is therefore a meaningful day for me to be talking about Shakespeare's ballets, Shakespeare's without words, on the day which is the World Dancing Day, World Dance Day, okay? So we'll go back to our Do you read, my lord? And of course, 
hundreds of web answers is words, words, words. Well, it's very interesting to have Hamlet say this to a very wordy uh, character <coughs> in Shakespeare's play, Hamlet, Polonius. Words, words, words. Now, we all know that Shakespeare was interested in words. Shakespeare was interested in language. But we have to remember that he was also interested in something else. Now, in the same play, he makes Hamlet say, actually, in the same act, as you can see, a few lines later, the play is the thing. The context is very different, of course. But when we draw out the play is the thing away from that text and see it as a formula for Shakespeare, who, as I said, was interested in the language, but he was also interested <coughs> in the play moving onto the stage. He wrote for the stage. He wrote for the theater. So when we take the play is the thing out of his uh, text, Hamlet, the play, that is the formula for transforming Shakespeare's works as a silent, lifeless text, printed text, onto the stage, onto the performer's version, and giving <coughs> them three-dimensional flesh and life status. This is what Shakespeare was interested. As I said, he wrote for the theatre. Now, we also must remember that he was a shareholder. He was an actor. And that's why he's writing for the theatre. Now, being a shareholder, of course, he was very much interested in the show business of his days. He wanted to get the money that he would like to get from the boxes. <coughs> he was watching out for that. And therefore, he's writing for the performance. Now, while I'm talking, I will also uh, remind you about the development of theater history from his days onwards and how his place in his time and moving on 17th century, 18th century, 19th century, changing in performance, ad additions being made to his performances. Uh, his, the theater. The building, the constructions change, theater gimmicks change, performance styles changing, directions changing, and uh, actors' interpretations of the roles changing. That's also continuing along with Shakespeare moving throughout the centuries coming to our century. And this is continuing. Now, a lot of this, we said that Shakespeare wrote for the stage. On stage, we see Shakespeare as operas as well, as ballets as well. But opera and ballet did not yet establish themselves as independent performance styles in his time. But if they had, in the 16th century, there was an established ballet and opera genre, if we had these genres in his time, he would have been a lovely choreographer. He would have been an opera composer. He would do that. Why? Because he was very much sensitive to the dance and the music of his days. Very much interesting, he was aware of the lively court uh, dances of his time. Now, when I say court dances, courtly dances, this brings us to the ballet history as well, because the, from the court dances and moving throughout the centuries, ballet is gaining and independence, our independent status, and then we see choreographers <coughs> attempting to balletize Shakespeare's works. So these two, these um, arts, performance arts, converge. Now, when we say court ballets, these are the times when we see ballet starting for the first time, most of the time, the members of the nobility took part in these activities, and it was some festive occasion. But when we think of Elizabeth the first court, that was a festive court too, made up of courtiers who had to be very skilled dancers and musicians. So Shakespeare was aware of that as well. Now this, in the Renaissance period, it, it, the time when Shakespeare was around, we also see in Europe the court ballets uh, 
uh, developing and famous works taking place. Now, one work in 1581 has always been considered in ballet history as the first ballet of ballet history. Although we do have in Sultan Suleiman's Istanbul, earlier than that, slightly earlier than that, some Venetian performance coming to Istanbul and performing some kind of a balletic performance. So that period could be considered as the first ballet performance also in Istanbul by Venetians. But we come to this uh, ballet comique de la Reine as the main uh, ballet starting ballet history. And also, this is the period where we see a lot of writings on uh, not ballet, of course, but dance and body movement, hand movements, feet positions, and analysis of this. And a very famous treatise in 1588 uh, by Sono Arbo deals with these dances, all these courtly dances of the period, like Pavan, Gagnard, Corante, and a lot of other dances in detailed analysis, giving the feet positions as well. Now, when we move along the century, we come to comedy ballets, especially in the French court by uh, in Louis XIV, the king of that period, a famous, famous king. He's supposed to be a state person, but he was interested in performance, performing himself, actually, in ballet comics. And, of course, we see the development of ballet as well. And um, he is someone who established Académie Royale de Danse in 1661, which means now ballet is gaining some uh, individual status with some <coughs> academical work on it, some principles based on the uh, performance, because that was important in that period. Now, then we move along. As we move along, we have ballet d'action in ballet 